Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and it's wonderful to welcome you to the Brookings Institution. My name is John Allen, and I'm the president of the institution, and we're pleased to have you with us here today. This morning event is, event is entitled, Why Facts and Think Tanks Matter, and coincides with the launch of the 2018 Global Go-To Think Tank Index, which is led by Dr. Jim McGann of the University of Pennsylvania. Now, first and foremost, Jim, we are truly honored to host this event today, though I suspect all of us on this stage are, stage are biased on this point. This is an incredibly important topic, and we're glad to discuss it, and we're glad to have a platform to share our perspectives on the ideas that continue to matter so much today in this very challenging time. It's a unique role for think tanks to play during this period, and we're glad to talk about it and to talk about how we fit into the societies uh, of our respective think tanks as we go along. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'd like to do is introduce Jim McGann, who has some opening remarks, and then I'll introduce our panel members, and then we'll kick off. Jim? I'm going to be very brief. So we have um, a sustained period of time for the, for the panelists to make their brief presentations and then obviously a discussion. Um, I want to welcome everyone to uh, this uh, program, Why Facts and Think Tanks Matter. Uh, the significance of that is I'm, uh, these days is not lost on anyone, I'm sure. Um, I want to thank Brookings um, and uh, John Allen uh, and Jen Berlin and Elliot uh, Fleming uh, for their assistance in helping uh, make this uh, program possible. Uh, and certainly the panelists uh, that have uh, consciously this year, as you may know in previous years, it has been entirely uh, a panel comprised of U.S. think tank uh, executives. Uh, consciously this year, um, we have a number of executives uh, from uh, abroad on the panel to bring uh, their perspective, but also to underscore or underline the importance uh, which was brought up in the meeting of uh, breakfast meeting of think tank presidents uh, of partnerships, both domestic and international. Uh, and I would contend as a result of the increased um, polarization uh, politically and fragmentation uh, in terms of parties, partnerships uh, between and among think tanks across the political uh, spectrum will be increasingly important, and we should uh, encourage that. Uh, this is a global event um, that uh, is in uh, currently, uh, and the number is is growing. Um, there are 330 organizations in 85 countries that are simultaneously launching the Glo Global Go To report, but more importantly, engaging in, in uh, organically created, locally based programs to explore why facts and think tanks matter. Um, and so that. Uh, is what I believe is, is an effort to create a global community of think tanks and to do what I think we don't do enough of uh, and as well as we might, uh, which is we're very good as think tanks in terms of uh, engaging policymakers and the public on specific policy issues, but we're not uh, so good and don't engage as frequently as I think we should in what is the value, what is the purpose what is the value added of uh, think tanks uh, in countries around the world? And that's part of what this effort is, and it's part of what this uh, discussion uh, is intended to do. We are uh, in truly challenging and troubled times, and it is my firm belief, heavily biased since I've been studying think tanks for 35 years, so I uh, have great faith in the institutions, and I think that they are critical in terms of uh, meeting the challenges uh, we face, and I am confident that they will, but it will require significant adaptation, uh, innovation, and transformation of institutions. And there is, as I mentioned at the President's Breakfast, a digital divide among think tanks, those that get it and those that don't, uh, and that will be a significant and important element uh, in terms of the success and impact of think tanks going forward. Uh, just two uh, important announcements. One, uh, there will be the annual uh, 
think tank, North American think tank summit, which brings together Canadian, Mexican, and U.S. think tanks on March 26th and 27th to explore in greater depth these issues. And then second, as promised, if you uh, noticed a little note at the bottom, a big announcement in terms of the change uh, in the rankings uh, in 2019, there will be you know, a series of changes, but the biggest one will be uh, that any think tank that has been uh, uh, nominated and ranked for three consecutive years uh, will be placed in a uh, distinguished uh, center of excellence category and that will be reported at the uh, opening section of the report and in each and every section where the think tank has achieved uh, that distinction as a top think tank. They will be, uh, in addition, uh, uh, will sit out for five years in the ranking process. The intent is, one, to recognize um, those think tanks that have uh, sustained our, our sustained centers of uh, think tank excellence, and then secondly, to give the opportunity for other think tanks uh, to achieve the same level of excellence in the rankings. Uh, that's a major change that will take place and will be rolled out with greater specificity um, in 2019. So without further ado, I turn it back to John and, and to the panel. Well, this morning, as I said, it's a great honor for Brookings to have the opportunity to host this distinguished panel and this distinguished audience. And I see many friends in the audience that I've not seen for a bit, leaders in their fields, presidents and CEOs of other think tanks, and it's just wonderful to welcome you all here. I'd like to introduce the members of the panel this morning, if I may. Um, and I'll start from my far right, your far left. First, in is Thomas Gomar, is the director of the French Institute of International Relations. He's an expert in post-Soviet studies and is a widely published author and has been with the Institute in a number of progressively important management roles since 2004. So bonjour, Monsieur Gomar. Merci. <laughs> Next is, uh, I'm not going to try to do this for everyone, by the way. I, uh, I run out of language pretty quickly. Um, Paolo Magri is our next uh, guest. He's the Executive Vice President and Director of the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. He's also Professor, professor of International Relations at Bocconi University and holds a number of board and advisory positions and is an expert on many of the most important issues we are studying and we are studying today and that are impacting the Middle East. So, buongiorno, signore. Grazie mille. <laughs> then we have Paul Salam. He is the most recent president of the Middle East Institute and has been president of the Middle East Institute, a tremendous organization since October of 2018. As this name might imagine, or this, as the Institute's name might imagine, he focuses on issues of political change and transition and conflict, as well as regional and international relations in the Middle East. He's widely published and no stranger to the think tank community, and having founded the Carnegie Middle East Center uh, in Beirut before his current assignment and directing the Ferris Foundation before that, he's deeply, uh, deeply seated in that region. And Paul, welcome. Uh, I hear that you compose Arabic and Brazilian jazz music. That will be the final question of the morning uh, to try to figure out what that is. So, sabah khair, sidi, shukran jazilin. Next, uh, Sarah Rosen Wartel. Thank God we're now in the English portion. <laughs> she is president of the Urban Institute, a role she has held since uh, 2012. And prior, she was founding COO and later executive vice president of the Center for American Progress. And before that, she held the position of deputy assistant for economic policy and deputy director of the National Economic Council for President Clinton. And before that, Sarah was the deputy assistant secretary for Ho Federal Housing Administration uh, at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Brookings is honored and humbled to share the Tax Policy Center with the Urban Institute. 
a true public servant. Sarah, you are most welcome here this morning. Thank you. And last and certainly not least is Ken Weinstein, who is the president and CEO of the Hudson Institute. Uh, Ken has been with Hudson since 1991 and became CEO of the Institute in 2005 and later CEO and president in 2011 and is a political theorist by trade. He is also the chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors and a regular guest on radio and television. Ken, you're most welcome. And everyone, thank you for joining us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we're slated for about an hour and a half. We started a bit late because of the weather and folks uh, coming in from the breakfast. Uh, what I'd like to do is go for an hour here at the table with a number of questions that we have, and then for the remaining period that we have, we'll go out to the audience for Q&A. A reminder that this panel is very much on the record, and we're being live streamed, so our audience is coming to us over the Internet as well. And for those of you who are joining us over the Internet, you probably had some pretty good judgment with respect to the cold this morning. Um, and when we go to the q and I'll, I'll remind you, we'll, we'll ask you for a question relatively early in the process. So if I don't hear a question mark-like thing appearing in the first 30 seconds, I'll ask you to move quickly to your questions. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, kick off. It's a very important series of points that uh, Jim made this morning in his opening remarks. These are difficult times. And it's difficult times in general to find truth and to understand even what truth might mean. And so let me start uh, on the far uh, left with uh, Thomas and ask, please, in the context of, of uh, the French in Institute for International Relations, why do facts and think tanks matter today? Yeah, I will start with the word today by starting with yesterday. Uh, if you are seated in Europe and in France in particular, you belong to an industry which was invented, you know, more than 100 years ago by, for instance, Carnegie in 1910, by Brookings in 1917, the Council in 1921. So, in fact, the job was invented there, and now we see the transformation of this job you know, seen from, seen from uh, uh, Europe, there is two main transformative forces at the time being. The very first one is the emergence of the Chinese think tanks. I will be back on that. And consequently, the transformation of the US think tanks. And seated in Europe, and once again, I think it's uh, my particular vision, these two transformative forces will impact of way of uh, researching, of way of doing our job. So that's my, my, very first, uh, my very first concern, is to say that to some extent, the question for us at E3, it's not only today, it's how do we continue you know, to develop the think tank industry given the heritage and give us the transformative force. The problem we all face, I think, is the evolution of the Chinese think tanks. Let me just um, quote briefly President Xi Jinping about uh, think tanks in October 2014. A uh, think tank should be driven by communist party and follow the right line. So what does it mean, in fact, to interact with our Chinese colleagues in this, um, in this context, given the fact that the Chinese think tanks are more and more tools of public diplomacy, whereas, you know, European think tanks or US think tanks are uh, acting in a, in a different, different way. I will stop with uh, this uh, very uh, initial remark. I am very concerned, seated in Paris, by the fact that authoritarian regimes seem to be more and more interested in think tanks, whereas I would say open regime or democratic regimes are less and less interested in their think tanks. And I think that this evolution is very critical for um, uh, all of us. The second big uh, issue I, I would like to, to, to mention quickly it is the evolution of the ideas industry. You know, I, I, I use the word by Dresner in his, in his book. I think we are facing two things uh, which are a challenge for think tanks. The very first one is the fact that ideas industry is widespreading, whereas in my view, think tank is, is, industry is maybe retracing first. And secondly, we have a polarization of ideas in this industry, especially in the US, given also the political evolution in the US, because the end may be of the uh, revolving door in the US because of this, this administration. And the, uh, the, I would say, the preeminence now of thought leaders against public intellectuals. So that's a big challenge for all of us in terms of what sort of research 
should we produce, and what sort you know, of debate should we organize? Thank you very much. Paolo, would you care to comment? Yes, please. Uh, I will start from uh, one of Thomas' remarks. Uh, this peculiar situation we are facing in which uh, in non-democratic countries, you mentioned China, uh, non-democratic countries are putting a lot of emphasis in creating, enhancing think tanks. But the big question is, are these uh, think tanks are as we define them? While on the other side, uh, in other countries, and we belong sometimes to this second group, in advanced democratic countries, most of us are increasingly marginalized uh, out of the decision-making or decision policy uh, process. Uh, someone to be reassuring in the early morning uh, in this cold weather, uh, to answer to your question, John, uh, why think, do think tank matter? Uh, there is a reassuring answer that is until when decision have to be taken uh, by institution, government and companies, and policy to be adopted, there will be a role for thin tanks. But this reassuring uh, position is less so if we take into account or into the picture two issues. Decision will have to be taken, but who is taking decision now? Uh, sometimes uh, uh, new guys uh, in office uh, that we don't know. This is true for uh, Italy with the new government. This was true with Trump two years ago in the States. Uh, people who take decision in a more centralized way with less scrutiny, uh, even in democracy. And the second point is how decisions are taken. Uh, taking very often taking into account increasingly polls, short term, and the people. So we are still relevant, often in uh, some countries more marginalized. And the point is, and this is my last comment, how do we get out of there? that? How do we get out of this role we are often confined to provide facts uh, post-decision, uh, the, the role in which we try to reach uh, the public and the people and the policymaker with the counter-narrative of decision taken, not decision shaped by us. And the co last comment is, uh, on one side, we, oh, well, we are all looking ways to engage with the new political uh, actors, but the issue there is to engage and not to be engaged, which is the risk. And the second one, we are all struggling to reach a new audience. Jim mentioned that a few minutes ago. Uh, everybody in the previous panel mentioned that. Uh, the public opinion, which becomes uh, more relevant in a moment of populism, which in which government pretend to be acting for the people. I've never seen any government, apart from dictatorship, pretending to act against the people. But this is what we are being told. The new government act for the people, so we have to reach the people. And I have a concern on that, two concerns. The first one, in reaching out the new audience, which is different from the one we had in the past, we are somehow like influencer, without being. We compete with real influencers, political activists, those making advocacy, young kids posting their strange videos on, video, on, on, on the web with two million uh, likes. Uh, and we struggle with our background, which is whatever we call it. We had a, a discussion provoked by Thomas on whether we should call ourselves a scientist. Uh, we discuss if we should call ourselves scientists, but when we promote, pro 
pro promote and we prepare a video or an Instagram and whatever, uh, we have our background. We have internal meetings in which the guy from the communication department wants to do something and six researchers say, no, it's not exactly what I wanted to say. And it takes two weeks and then we get out oh, with this sure. sometimes <laughs> and we get out with a story which is boring. <laughs> boring. I keep telling a story, Jim, sorry to repeat that. I have a 15 year old, uh, the, daughter, the daughter of the son of my sister, and I was very proud showing him, look, Luca, we did this video on migration and we had 80,000 uh, like, 80,000. It's smart, it's new. And my, the son of my daughter came to me, come on, uncle. Look at this, it was a video produced by someone close to Lega, two million and a half. But the guy didn't have to meet with the researcher, to <laughs> the planning committee. The guy w went there on PC and made his movie. It looked like very professional. The second concern, and I'm, I'm sorry for taking time, I will be shorter later. When we talk about this, we always talk about rich audience, which be as in the back of the mind, a vertical vision. We have the truth. These guys do not understand anything. And we only have to reach out to find a new way to pack our truth and to reach out. And when I think of that, I always remember the Arab Spring. When the Arab Spring happened, we were all surprised. All studying the Middle East, we were all saying, uh, uh, Mubarak is stable, uh, the president of Libya is stable, everybody was very stable and in two weeks they all went down or sometimes more time. And I remember someone telling me, you know why we, you were all saying that it's stable? Because if you visit this country, you researcher, sometimes you describe the country from Washington, if you visit the country, you don't even talk to the taxi driver while you are going to meet the member of parliament or, or the director of a think tank. And you go to see them and ask them, how is the situation here? And they say, it's fine, stable, perfect. If you at least talk to the driver, you would get a completely different story. So when we discuss about reaching out the new audience, we have to be very humble. We have to understand what's going on, why they vote for Salvini and Di Maio, why they voted for Trump, why they are against big infrastructure. It's not just reaching them out with our embellished truth made by young researchers sitting in Milano or Paris or whatever. Thank you. Paul, I, I know you didn't take that personally. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was about this. It's the only way I can get to the hotel. Please, uh, Paul, give us some of your thoughts, please. Uh, yeah, when I look at, you know, the, why do facts and think tanks matter today, and I look at the word facts, to my, to my mind, the challenge of think tanks, of course, is to m try to marshal the facts, put them either in a social science context, whether you're looking at an economic situation or political studies, political science, or in a long-term timeline, or we don't do climate change, but if, if you're looking at facts of the weather, it's what context you put them in and what intellectual capital you bring to organizing those facts and getting them to tell you something significant and something important. To my mind, think tanks, by definition, are special intellectual centers which bring academic expertise or the expertise of long-term policymakers who come back into the think tank world, who have the time to gather the facts, which are not gathered by them, usually it's gathered, you know, whether it's through a news organization or the World Bank or others, take those facts and work on them to see what sense they make, what they mean for the future in whatever sector you're looking at, and then matching that social science or science, if it's a natural science, uh, analysis to policy options and then coming up with some policy prescription. So that, to me, is the trade or the industry. Uh, the challenge, obviously, there is the real work of a think tank is getting farther and farther away from the current communication challenges, uh, which is all in sound bites or all in short videos. Um, 
and so the more, in a way, the think tank is doing its work properly, the bigger the challenge is to reboil that down to something, whether a one-pager that a policymaker will read or a tweet that 60,000 people might see or a one-minute video. And so that's sort of a third level of challenge that think tankers have. It's on the communication side because a think tank, unlike a university, measures its impact by what, what impact it has, not, well, I've done great research and now we can all go home. So think tanks have the additional challenge of saying, well, now I have to invest you know, half of my budget on just communicating this stuff, let alone thinking it through. A fourth challenge, to my mind, is that at the end of the day, even among informed and reading you know, publics or decision makers and so on, uh, people are stuck in their narratives. And facts and even many theories about those facts sink into those narratives like a black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, people have already generally made their mind up. And you can take, for example, in the Middle East. Generally, you know, most of the facts are well known. You know, what's happening here and now you might differ over the numbers and so on. The dispute is not about the facts. Often the dispute is what narrative you have. And you can integrate any, almost any fact into your ready-made narrative. Uh, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the climate change debate. Today, you know, it's cold, so there's no climate change. It's cold, so there is climate change. And anybody, <laughs> you know, the fact can easily be, uh, be integrated. And that, you know, really gets me also to the sort of Part B of the communication challenge is that in order to impact, have an impact in your communication, it goes well beyond making the video, doing the tweet. It's almost the art of engaging, trying to change somebody else's narrative. And that is more of an art. It's more about storytelling. Uh, it's exceedingly difficult. Uh, and I've only lived in DC for the last five years now. And even in D.C., or even especially in D.C., I mean, let alone, you know, inner America, who maybe they don't have as many facts, people's minds are already made up. Uh, and they're already uh, integrating facts very ably in the world's views that they already have. And that makes it really difficult to change, uh, you know, to, to move the needle on anything. Uh, so I think the challenge, certainly, I mean, today, maybe recently, even facts have been disputed. but. In most of the areas where I work, it's not so much the facts, but then the nine steps you have to do beyond the facts, uh, which are the challenge. But I'll end by saying that having worked in think tanks in the Middle East and think tanks here, and I can list the dozens of, and dozens of challenges here and in the Middle East, obviously, I really do think think tanks matter in an enormous way. Uh, I think not to be crude about it, but sort of dollar for dollar or man hour, person hour to person hour, they have a very big impact on policy debates, policy discussions, public opinion, and eking into policy making, given their minuscule size at the end of the day. You know, all the media conglomerates are, you know, a thousand times bigger than think tanks, newspapers, and so on. But the way they focus a discussion, they come out with analysis and perspectives that make their way into everybody else's talking points and discussion, uh, both in the Middle East and here, to my mind, I, I always come back by concluding this is an extremely important and extremely worthwhile sector. Thank you. Sarah, please. Those were all terrific comments. Thanks. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks, John. Um, so let me first talk a little bit about why facts matter in a, uh, and, and this is some, what I'll start with is something that I think you could have said at the founding of many of the institutions that you referred to 100 years ago, and then, and then talk a little bit about that frame quickly in the current moment. So facts matter because they help us not simply admire problems, but understand them, understand our circumstances and how they are changing. And we're at a time of very, very rapid change. And sometimes the experience of that change uh, in some places is less well understood by people far away from it. And so facts are really important to understanding the world we live in. Uh, 
Facts are important because they help us to design potential remedy, solution, changes in the underlying rules of the road. Uh, facts are also important because they help us measure the effect of the policy and practices that we have uh, and whether we're making a difference. And it's not just measure and evaluation, but it's also the relative ROI from different types of strategies to tackle the situation of people and our institutions and society. Uh, and then finally, facts really matter because this is how we hold the public actors accountable, whether it's uh, understanding what Facebook is, uh, the effects of Facebook, or whether it's understanding the effects of a local mayor's zoning policy. These are tools that we use. And that's true even in a world where people dispute the facts and they have their own different narratives and frames. So I think it's, it's useful to just go back to say facts are really important and all of our business model is about amassing evidence to help shape those sets of choices. So. Among the things that have changed, and people here, I'm not going to repeat some of the great comments made before, is that who is making change, who those facts are relevant to in our society today, is a much broader group of change makers. For a long time, institutions like ours principally got our brief from either federal agency actors or members of Congress or large national foundations who were trying to influence those relatively small set of decision makers. And we saw us over time broadening our frame of reference to the influencers who influence on those still small set of decision makers. But in a much more distributed society, for all the reasons we know about who has access to information, the people who make change today are much more distributed. And in a world where there's not a lot of confidence, at least in our country, in the capacity to uh, reach consensus to make change at a federal government level, change makers are decision makers at a lot of other levels of government. County government influence a huge amount of our social safety net, for example. People don't think about counties as a major, in the United States, as a major source of change, but they are, in fact, and states and localities. But even well beyond the actors of the public sector, change makers are increasingly social entrepreneurs. And you've got Larry Fink saying to the Fortune 50 CEOs that investors are going to demand of you your un a, a clear understanding of how your firm's actions are driving change in the fundamental problems of society, of uh, hardening inequalities and the like. So, if you go spend time at the business roundtable, uh, they not only think about maximizing the well-being of shareholders, but their role in driving societal change. So, and you can talk about social entrepreneurs and lots of other people. So the people who drive change and thus, I wouldn't say just audience, because audience assumes it's a one-to-many communications model. But the people with whom we are, we like to say, helping to accelerate solutions. We bring facts to bear to accelerate change. Um, the, the, the partners with whom you do that work becomes much more distributed, very hard in our business models to be able to accomplish that. Um, but when you sit down and say, I'm going to sit in my office and tell you what the facts are and what you ought to do, you have a very different relationship with those change makers than if you sit down with those change makers and say, what is the change you're trying to make in the world? Let me help inform you from the beginning. What questions are you asking? How do, and we used to be pretty good at doing that with the public sector actors, but how do we do that with all of the different forces that influence change? So we're asking, answering the questions that they are asking in real time with information back to them so you create a continuous learning cycle to help drive societal change. It's a much more complicated assignment that we have, um, but it is also one in which I despair less because the forces you've described, the polarization and stalemate uh, and dispute um, about the, whether your facts are biased or not, don't happen, I find, nearly as much when I'm talking to a community foundation in Minneapolis or when I'm talking to the uh, human services administrator for the state of Idaho or when I'm talking to even local electeds and the like. And they become an ecosystem that acts back on the national too. So um, maybe there's, uh, it, our jobs are harder, but the opportunity for influence and impact seems to me also to be greater than we can think about when we're sort of locked in Washington. 
Great comments, sir. Thank you. And Ken, please. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you, Jim, for the important work you do. And uh, just in a large agreement with what is said, I'll try to state it in a little bit less diplomatic manner, which is that I think, at least from the point of view of Washington think tanks, I think in some sense a lot of Washington think tank work, uh, there's been kind of an echo chamber in a sense of work that is done on both the left and the right in which there are nuances, shades of difference. And I think that uh, uh, what we've seen and what the 2016 election was about was the discrediting of elites in our country uh, and even in, in some countries, for example, in France, uh, where uh, the, the Macron election was sort of a return of the uh, elites, uh, we've seen again that the populist uh, movements have, have challenged uh, uh, the return of the elites in some ways. And I think this is an incredibly fluid moment in the policy world, unlike any we have ever seen. Uh, and it makes our work, it makes the work of think tanks all the more important uh, because there are major some of the most basic questions in public policy are up for grabs now uh, on free trade, uh, on our tax system, uh, uh, our alliances and the like, and uh, the defense spending, engagements in Afghanistan, Syria, et cetera. And so the, the question is, uh, what does that mean for, for organizations such as ours? And, and uh, I think at this, uh, it's, a, it's an unbelievable moment, uh, but there, I think it's a moment of huge opportunity if you can uh, take advantage of, uh, say, the, the general distrust of uh, now in the U.S.-China relationship and the distrust of the Chinese think tanks. And Tomai, I agree with you 100 percent. I will say that when you get the Chinese think tankers alone at dinner after one of these sessions where they will sp spout the party line, if you push them, you will you can see where they, uh, they disagree, and it can be a useful exercise sometimes. Uh, but uh, there, there's a huge opportunity to, to move the policy agenda in a serious way, uh, uh, to, to question some of the basics at a time when even, uh, when our, now our, our business leaders are beginning to wonder what they engage with, and I give the Trump administration huge credit for uh, shifting the policy debate on China in the United States, in Asia, and also in Europe, and uh, we at Hudson, I, take some credit, Mike Pillsbury's work and the work of others has been critical to that. So there, there are huge opportunities there. There are opportunities in a number of areas, uh, missile defense and even on alliance work that uh, remains. So I think that uh, our work is, is, is all the more important. Uh, uh, one has to be clear-sighted as to what the policy opportunities are that you can uh, try to forge a, a consensus on, but uh, you can certainly uh, move it forward. Uh, at this time, but it's very important. Uh, Herman Kahn, the founder of Hudson, always had a rule. He always he always talked to taxi drivers, found them uh, far more interesting uh, than uh, uh, people here in Washington, people in Los Angeles, uh, and elsewhere. And I and I when I and a lot of our think tank work is we travel around the world, and I always make sure both engaging with taxi drivers here, Uber drivers here. Uh, but also uh, around the world to get a sense of how they view how their governments are faring, because it gives a very, and, and I think it's, a, it's, we need to be able to incorporate uh, these kinds of understandings uh, more strongly into what is essentially an elite-driven phenomena here in Washington and in other nation, national capitals. Well, taxi drivers have figured prominently uh, yeah. in our discussion this morning. <clears throat> I uh, had the occasion that's right. I had occasion a couple of years ago to have to, to do a an event on Afghanistan in uh, New York City, and an Afghan taxi driver delivered me to the event, and I, I described what I was about to do. He was Pashtun, and I was delivered back to the train station by another Afghan taxi driver who had actually heard the event, who was Tajik, and I got an earful. I'm yeah. telling you. So uh, it was like a graduate course in Afghan politics, and, uh, and I listened to every word they had to say. So we've had some wonderful uh, remarks and comments on just on this first and essential question, uh, the emergence of authoritarian regimes who now see that potentially think tanks have a role for them in the continuation of their policies. Certainly the uh, emergence of Chinese think tanks is something that we all have to take into account that non-democratic uh, societies or illiberal uh, societies have, uh, in many respects, uh, marginalized the public policy process, or we find that think tanks uh, have to uh, run fast behind decisions that have been made to try to give the context for those. 
Paul's point, uh, I thought, ver was very important about how facts have a distinct relationship to the narrative. And that's, uh, that's, there's a lot to that that probably deserves some additional consideration. And Sarah's very important points uh, on why th facts matter uh, for the potential design of remedies, for uh, an understanding of the return on investment, and very importantly, facts matter uh, to hold people accountable. And that's uh, essential, particularly in this world we live in today. And Ken's points, which was very important, is to understand when the policy discussion presents opportunities for think tanks to weigh in an important way. <clears throat> so let's, let's just start again with Thomas. Uh, we're now in uh, 2019. Uh, what does it require of a think tank to be relevant uh, in this particular moment uh, in our history? Uh, it's fast paced, it's technology driven. Wh what should we be thinking about? as think tanks in order for us to be relevant to this very new environment uh, of the 21st century. Thomas? Let me start with a, a paradox which was um, written by um, a friend of all of you, I suppose, uh, Robin Niblet in uh, uh, his article on think tanks uh, published in International Affairs. Niblet explained to us that we are allocated uh, a lot of energy and resources uh, to disseminate our production, uh, whereas this production is more and more put in questions by the, um, by the, the different stakeholders of, of the think tank uh, co community. So but that leads me to, to try to respond to your question. For me, the key word is not impact. The key word is intellectual relevance to try to understand properly what is going on. So it's very easy to say that like that, but it's obviously much more difficult to, to, to do in reality and to uh, translate that into a research, a research program. So for me, it's intellectual, re intellectual relevance, which is highly important, and to very well understand the uh, transformation of the uh, world affairs, but consequently the transformation of our uh, industry. But that leads me to a second point. I think that in all industry, we see two categories of actors. Very often, director, executive are either managers or I would say researchers and thinkers. And I think there is a strong need to be back to the thinking, to big thinking for think tanks. And that's why any type of platforms able you know, to uh, to, to bridge different approaches in terms of thinking would be most, most, most very, very welcome, sorry. Um, the third thing is, uh, I do think that, especially in France, you know, that's fascinating to observe all our states. Our culture is very different than yours because the state in France created its own body of expertise, historically. But what is happening now, it is the fact that these states, to some extent, cut all its body to try to anticipate the future. There is less and less body to, to think the medium and the long terms. The newcomers think tanks, you know, are much more, I would say, soft lobbyists, or they try to invest, as it was said, maybe half of their budget, you know, on communication. And I think that our task is precisely to bridge short, medium, and long term. There is a strengthening in our democratic regimes for thinking the long, the long run, which is less and less supported in my country by the, by the state. So for me, that's clearly on that, I think uh, we, should, uh, we should invite. Let me add a, a, a fourth thing. I started, we know, with the, the transformative force of the Chinese think tank. Uh, it's not to say that it's uh, the enemy, not at all. My point is, uh, um, on the contrary, to say that I see room for all the think tanks to try to create interface with our colleagues whatever they are coming from. I think that our job is also to keep channels open when the uh, political uh, 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 relations are uh, difficult. So I stop there. And, and to be clear, I certainly didn't, I don't know that the audience did, I didn't detect your remarks yeah. as the emergence of Chinese think tanks are a threat. It's just a new force in the spectrum of our think tank. And we just have to be aware of it and account for it. And I think that's a very important uh, realization. Paolo. 
your thoughts, please, on the 21st century yes. think tank. <clears throat> Relevance in, in our time. Uh, I, I fully agree with what Thomas said. The challenge, but I would say the first challenge, is to be uh, intellectually relevant, uh, uh, which means uh, producing idea, understanding, being humble, being scientifically solid, uh, listening and talking to taxi driver wherever we are. But as I said, this is the first challenge because on top of that challenge, we have the challenge of dissemination. Let's call it whatever we want, reaching new audience, uh, influence. And I think I am in this table, John, uh, because I represent uh, a minority, uh, a minority in United States, but the majority in Europe, which means uh, small institutes. To be very specific, I guess I don't want to ask my colleague, but I, I guess it, should I ask them how large is their communication department, the answer would be close to the total number of staff of my institute, which is a little bit smaller than free. So we are not far. Talking in terms of budget, you mentioned we should invest half of our budget in communication. I don't ask you what do you mean by half of your budget, but I can tell you it's not secret <laughs> that uh, uh, my budget is 5 billion euro. His budget is 6 billion euro, total budget. Maybe we can invest, we cannot. Mil no. <laughs> uh, if, you know, if it's billion, exactly, I want to create a new relationship. Thank you, John. <laughs> thank you, John. That's exactly the, the question I wanted to stress how I do represent a minority in this table. Okay. Uh, that was my objective. I was provoking a little bit. The, why am I saying that? Because what we are discussing, we represent the large majority, I look at the gym, of think tanks all over the world, the small ones. Uh, the America, Great Britain, and a few other countries are the exception. So when we discuss these challenges, which is one plus two, solid ideas and dissemination, at the end of the day, when I go home and discuss this with my colleagues, my communication department is made by one person plus two stagiaires. And usually these two person and a half or one and a half are also in charge of eating maintenance uh, administration and uh, 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 the controlling the portman uh, when he is on vacation. Am I saying that this is impossible? No. Uh, we have to utilize, uh, sorry John, to, to get some of your wo the words of your word. We cannot build an army we have to look a little bit like Viet Cong, uh, meaning <laughs> guerrilla. So we have to, to, to find our way. But I wanted to mention this, because uh, this puts into our discussion, in this international presentation, the other dimension, which means how this is difficult uh, for uh, smaller think tanks. And then my last comment uh, is, on this second challenge, which is communication, I mentioned before the difficulties we face in competing with uh, uh, competitors which do only that, and which are free to invent their story, their short video, and so on. Uh, I have one fear for our industry. We look at other think tanks, and we look at cooperation and competition with other existing think tanks. But building up a fake think tank, not fake news, a fake think tank is extremely easy. Because there is a wide and broad definition of think tanks. We self-define ourselves as think tanks. But at the end of the day, if, if you have a website, a lot of infographics and video, a director, two sponsors, and you organize one event, you can pretend you are a think tank. And what about, what if this new populism that we call it in different way in different countries comes up very soon with think tanks? 
that are like us, but put on top of their fake story the, uh, the framework of uh, an even more solid uh, background being uh, a think tank. So we start seeing that in some cases uh, on Russia. Uh, in Italy, for example, there is a fake think tank uh, which deliver the, the Russian position, but he is a think tank. He is invited to meeting because he, he has a website, a director, to sponsor, and so on. So this is my comment, John. Paul, please. Yeah, John, if I may, I wanted to make a comment about uh, just the, the fact issue. And uh, just to say that we're talking about think tanks, and there's so many of them working on different, uh, different areas, that it's very clear that in some issue areas, uh, for example, you know, tax, tax uh, water management, uh, uh, climate change, a number of things, those are a certain type of policy challenge where uh, you can do the study, the facts, the disagreement might be about how this fact will affect that fact, and those are exceedingly important in the Middle East and here and all over the world. And then there's another uh, set of issues, for example, that we deal with, or certain Brook, you know, Brookings and, and Carnegie. When you look at the Middle East, or the big issues, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the Iranian conflict with the Gulf or with Israel, the US, the Turkish-Kurdish conflict, the Afghan conflict, Yes, facts come into it, but it's, you know, where when a think tank is, is engaging, it's trying to see how to negotiate, how to propose new ways forward. Uh, you know, facts are not really where, where it's at. And that's why I would just say that there are some issues where it's, more, you know, really the work is fact and science-based, and others it is really quite different. So it's a broad spectrum. On how to be relevant in the 21st century, I would say that there's been a profound change to the world of communication and world of information, disinformation, through that public sphere. But that the challenge of policymakers, that the decisions they have to make, challenges they face, and the type of information and analysis they might need hasn't fundamentally changed. Um, uh, so I think uh, in some ways it's it's not altogether very different when you're trying to influence a policymaker who has to worry about, you know, what decision do I make on this issue. They might appreciate, you know, some extra analysis and expert opinion to make that decision. But on the public sphere, uh, it's uh, very, very different. And we've already talked about the challenges of impacting in this very loud public sphere uh, we at MEI have made the decision to use uh, in our videos more cats. So. <laughs> <laughs> more cats, uh, yes, Patos. more clicks. And we're in negotiation with the administration if we can use Persian cats because that could be, <laughs> could be controversial. You'll end up sanctioned. I know. <laughs> uh, but let me end with a few comments about uh, the state and you know interacting with the state, maybe putting on my Middle East hat, uh, uh, that obviously the main challenge in the Middle East is that states are stamping out and prohibiting think tanks to start with. Uh, that's you know one challenge, and they are creating two types of think tanks. One type, which might be a useful one, uh, is one which they think they need to feed into their policy process, legitimate. I mean, it's a little bit maybe, you know, the U.S. government has, maybe Rand and others, you know, tell us, you know, we're dealing with this issue and that issue, give us insight. Uh, there are a number of those that are, that are sprouting up, and many of them are very serious, very professional, and they feed directly into a policy process, and that's a good thing, I would say. And then, of course, there is the, uh, uh, the think tanks that are being produced, maybe, We've heard about the Chinese cases, but also in the Middle East, think, fake think tanks that are being produced to, in a way, create disinformation or fake news. And that obviously is extremely, uh, extremely troublesome. So that relationship to the state, uh, even in the US probably, is, is an interesting and complex one. I would also want to end with one thing that is certainly relevant in the US, but also very relevant in the Middle East, despite the climate is that we usually focus on the fact that think tanks produce studies and reports and information. But they also produce people. Uh, in the US, obviously, it's that revolving door. You know, They serve an administration. They come and they go back. There's a positive side to that, that those 
people in the think tank over the years that they're out of office at least are focusing on the issue that they're supposed to focus on and hopefully go back with more expertise. What I found in the Middle East in some think tanks uh, w is uh, whereas there is no uh, uh, beltway, as it were, to get into government. There no real, there's no real politics, there's no real gateway to get in, yet the government needs technocrats. And they don't produce technocrats. Uh, so it's often the case that people who, young people who come out of college, join a Middle East think tank, work for 10 years, become expert at something, for a long time the government is very upset with them because they're speaking out on a public issue, and then in some crisis they say, well, let's hire this person because they seem to know what they're talking about. And I've seen many cases where in the absence of a political conveyor belt, the think tank has been a rare place where you can get the ideas in because you put those ideas in a person and now the person is in. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much on that. Th terrific uh, thoughts. Sarah, please. So on relevance, a couple things. First, on your communications point. Um, I worked at a think tank uh, long ago that uh, came close to the 50-50 model here in the United States. Um, it was unusual in its design and build, and it was built intentionally to uh, try to shape a, a wider debate. Today uh, at Urban, we are over 500 people. We have over 50 people in our communications department, so about 10%. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I hope she didn't say that. <laughs> I knew because I checked before. Checking. <laughs> Sorry. She, she does. Uh, <laughs> she does. As probably do you, John. But, um, I but, do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but what they do is not just dissemination of a report. It's about being part of the design and thinking about the audience of the work and who we're trying to reach and engage and uh, making sure that when uh, decision makers are thinking about questions, they know that there's an expert here uh, that can engage. So it's, it's also a much broader understanding of what we mean by communications than we did once before. Um, to this question of relevance, there's, I probably have said this at this panel in prior years, but in the United States, there's a, one of the world's greatest hockey players was a guy named Wayne Gretzky. And this may be apocryphal, but the story goes that Gretzky's father taught Gretzky that good hockey players skate to where the puck is, and great hockey players skate to where the puck is going to be. And so I think to your question of how do you stay relevant, when our colleagues at the Tax Policy Center anticipating that uh, uh, 2017 was going to be a year in which corporate tax policy was at the top of the agenda, spent 2015 and 16 building the corporate tax components of the models that we use to analyze. That is about skating to where the puck is going to be. Uh, when we work with a uh, foundation, in this case recently the AARP Foundation, on a piece of analysis that we did about the challenges of older workers, older Americans who are still in the workforce, and they changed their foundation strategy to help them now focus on that problem, we were part of them anticipating what comes next for their body of work. So it is very much relevance is about being able to look around corners. And I think a number of people have said that about thinking about the future in important ways. Um, and I guess the last thing about relevance is something that those of us who've spent our careers mostly in policy influence aren't as so good at. John talks about this a lot as well. It's we need to be far more fluent in the way that technology is changing our society. And I would say that it, that matters to us in two ways. Of, of course it is understanding technology's impact on the problems that we're applying ourselves to, whether it's the spread of information or the changing nature of the labor market in the United States and educational opportunity and how we deliver education, all of those things. Um, so there is an understanding of technology's impact which requires us to have a different set of skill sets than the technocrats have traditionally had and social scientists have traditionally had. Um, but it is also about understanding the way we can embrace technology to do our work. Uh, so in our world, for example, um, we're used to using carefully curated official government statistics which are generated through um, uh, very carefully collected survey methods. But, you know, big data existing in the wild has lots of flaws and influences, but being good at mining it and being able to take advantage of the cloud to manipulate 
huge amounts of data to gain insight. That is transforming the way we do social science research um, and being able to use AI and other things to do our modeling to optimize for different policy outcomes instead of just put in three new variables changes the way we do research. So I would say the third thing for relevance is that our institutions need to gain a whole new set of skills that have not traditionally been part of our um, sort of toolbox. Yeah, thank you, John. Okay, it, it, again, very interesting comments. Sorry, it's hard to go last. No, no. It's look. I, look. I, I guess I, I think of this issue. It's funny. We're about eighty people all together. Our public affairs department is four people, so uh, maybe we're not. Uh, maybe we need to have a bigger public affairs department. And I think, in some ways, Hudson is kind of an old-fashioned think tank in a lot of ways, but not as old-fashioned as we used to be. So. For our founder, Herman Kahn, and for the Institute in the first 20 years of its existence, we produced reports like the 1967 classic, The Year 2000, or the uh, classic, the 1963 classic, I think it is, On Thermonuclear War. These were big studies that took an awfully long time to produce that, uh, you know, over a year, team working on it had a major long-term impact uh, when these uh, when these reports came out. They had a big focus on getting people to think in the long term on some critical issues. But uh, there were, and I'd, I'd say today, we still have this focus of trying to get the long-term picture correct, because if you don't get the long-term picture correct, you're not going to get the short and medium-term picture right. But uh, we have much more of a focus on policy relevance today, uh, as everybody does, uh, and as you need to. And, uh, and our focus is less then some think, think tanks focus on what policymakers ought to think, and our focus still remains how they ought to think, and how do you look at uh, the complex challenges uh, that policymakers face uh, in a world where we have security challenges uh, in Europe, we have security challenges in the Middle East, we have security challenges in Asia, um, uh, not to talk about numerous policy challenges uh, in Latin America and Africa, and so. Uh, what, you know, but thinking in this way, still, it's, it's allowed us to, uh, when we when the moment is right, through a, and here we've stepped up and we've put in place a government relations team over the last few years, and we've had been able to leverage our contacts both uh, at the White House, on Capitol Hill, and elsewhere to have an impact on policies. I mentioned China policy, the national security strategy, which was drafted by our, our colleague Nadia Shadlow uh, when she was deputy national security advisor at the Missile Defense Review. Uh, call for WTO reform, but a lot of the impact that we've had now is increasingly through our international partners who find themselves very much at a loss to make sense of events here and also at home. And so we find ourselves much more on the road uh, than in the past, uh, going to national capitals uh, to, to meet with uh, key officials uh, to talk about the challenges they face, talk about the challenges uh, the United States faces, and to, to think through ways to uh, that we can work together, uh, both uh, as countries, as think tanks, uh, to, to move uh, a stronger policy agenda forward. And so, um, and, and this international element uh, and the internationalization of the think tank business uh, has become uh, increasingly important. I find myself in contact, uh, if I look at my lunch and breakfast schedules, I'm meeting diplomats or officials from around the world, uh, certainly far more than I'm meeting my colleagues from other think tanks, uh, and uh, arguably as much as I'm seeing anybody uh, in this town. One, one last quick point is the, the, the rise of the public affairs industry, which has really transformed the think tank world, and this is something that we've seen in uh, Washington. We now see it in Brussels, uh, Paris, London, where um, public affairs firms uh, have increasingly sought to drive the, uh, the think tank agenda. It, they're not, it, they're, these are not fake think tanks, uh, as you put it, but they're uh, but uh, there, it requires uh, great uh, caution uh, and uh, prudence when dealing with uh, these firms. Uh, that's not to say that uh, the interests they represent are necessarily in any sense wrong and that there's some excellent partnerships that can be developed, but uh, uh, it's transformed the think tank business uh, in some fundamental ways uh, as well as we sort of, uh, uh, as there is, there's an attempt to sort of shape the agenda of work that uh, policy research organizations do, and it's something we need to be aware of as well. Well, these were terrific answers. Let me <clears throat> just uh, summarize just a bit. Uh, we heard uh, from Thomas two, two very important points, uh, and Sarah reinforced this at one point. 
where it's not just about impact, but it's also about intellectual relevance. And what think, tank, think tanks can do in the world today is, of course, to provide uh, short, medium, and long-term analysis. And I think the long-term uh, long -term analysis gets us to the Wayne Gretzky view of being able to anticipate where the issues will lead you. Um, and in a world where we have relatively tight electoral cycles and very tight media cycles, uh, everyone tends a military term, lots of folks tend to have what we call close battle fixation. You are focused on the end of the day. You're focused on the news for that night or the next election. Uh, and the capacity to think at the strategic level to see the deep horizon and provide uh, quality research and potential policy considerations is an extraordinarily valuable role for think tanks in this particular world. Paolo, of course, got my attention immediately when he talked about the Army versus the Viet Cong. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to be said for the smaller organizations. There's an agility and a freedom that some of the smaller organizations have uh, that they're not as weighed down with process. Um, and I thought that uh, uh, Paul's and Thomas's thoughts uh, about the emergence of fake think tanks. This is a real issue. Uh, and when you see the sophistication of communications and the use of technology in communications and deep fake uh, efforts that are underway now increasingly in the world, the role and the emergence of those think tanks that become frankly quite competitive because they can package their malicious or just wrong perceptions and their narratives in ways that are superior to standing think tanks with lots of experience and lots of resources. Uh, and of course I thought that Ken's uh, uh, point about what makes a think tank relevant in the 21st century is internationalizing. Uh, how much better could we be sitting in Washington about the relevance of uh, uh, Trump administration policies in Europe than to be tied closely to European think tanks who can help us to see it on the ground from where the, uh, the crack of the whip occurs. So, you know, this is really important. And we talk a lot here about how does a think tank remain relevant in the 21st century. And I think it's a function of some qualities, the quality of flexibility, uh, the quality of agility. And often think tanks are so big and so mired in process and so uh, dependent upon certain fundraising capabilities, it limits your flexibility and your agility. And those two qualities alone in the 21st century will determine your relevance. How flexible are you and how agile? How quickly can you, can you pivot an organization onto an issue uh, to maintain that intellectual relevance, which is essential? And then finally, technology, which Sarah, I think, hit very well. And that uh, technology with a think tank hits us, I think, in three ways. One is the technology associated with uh, statistical analysis, big data analytics and predictive analytics, which puts, I believe, a very sharp edge, in many respects, on our products and our research so that in the competition for facts, those who've done the legitimate big data analytics have an edge on theirs which makes their facts more relevant often than those who are, who are not. So it, it affects our research. Technology as it affects our capacity to disseminate our work, understanding the many different digital platforms that are now de rigueur. Uh, they're, they're part of the process every single day. And we have to understand what those platforms are and use them accordingly to reach the audiences that we have to spend even more time thinking about. And then finally, at a substantive level, level the policy associated with just technology in general. Uh, and I've just returned, I was overseas for the last 10 days, and everywhere I stopped, the conversation about what appears to be the growing challenge of the competitive environment, competitive ecosystems of technology that are emerging in the 21st century has everyone's attention. So technology touches think tanks in multiple ways as well. And let me just quickly, and we'll go to the audience in just a moment, let me ask, starting with Ken and going the other direction this time, within your institutions, could you just take a second and tell us what, what it, I know there are many, many priorities, but what's the biggest policy issue for each of your institutions? Uh, this is an incredible moment for the United States and the world in particular, and we're coming up very quickly on a presidential election. So as we think about our policy issues, what is the number one policy issue, if I could ask for each one of your institutions, please? Yeah, for, for us, it's uh, American national security, and in particular, it's uh, increasingly, we're increasingly focused on Asia, which means uh, uh, U.S., Japan, U.S., China, 
Uh, it means uh, South Korea's role in the alliance. It means uh, the defense of Taiwan, which is critical to us, and uh, doing all we can to uh, make sure that there's sufficient missile defense capacity uh, to assure that the North Koreans, whatever happens in the negotiations between the United States, the South Koreans, the North Koreans, and potentially the Japanese, that we can defend against whatever happens and whatever transformation occurs in North Korea. So for us, it's really looking at how the f grand forces of change around the globe, um, whether that's demographic change, uh, technological change, globalization, and climate, um, uh, are in many ways hardening the inequalities that we see in society and the bridges between the haves and have-nots, and looking to find ways in which those forces can be harnessed and said to be a way to create a kind of more inclusive growth and shared prosperity. And I want to emphasize one of those forces in particular that we spend a great deal of time uh, focusing on both in how we run our own internal institution as well as the effect of society, which is di uh, diversity and demographic change. Um, we haven't talked about that before, and I actually think I should have made that the first answer to your question about relevance, because um, I'm sure uh, many U.S. institutions at least uh, in the think tank space really suffer from not looking like America and not bringing the talents and the insights uh, from the communities that are we're looking at into our work. And so it's not just an HR problem, it's actually about changing fundamentally which questions you ask, how you communicate, what language you use to communicate, how you move from a disparities mindset to an assets mindset. There's a whole set of issues around thinking very differently about um, sort of not so much we as experts, but we as a mechanism by which insights from a lot of different places become part of the debate. So that's top of mind as well. And let me thank you specifically on the, the point about diversity. That's critical, I think, for the future of think tanks. Relevant think tank in the 21st century has got to be a diverse think tank. Paul, please. Uh, in the Middle East, it's a region uh, in flames. And so among the many priorities, the main one for us is doing what we can to bring about negotiated sustainable ends to the four civil wars that are causing such carnage. Uh, at the same time, uh, working to de-escalate regional conflict and work in the long term uh, towards an inclusive regional order that includes the main players, Arab countries, Israel, Iran, Turkey, so that such uh, uh, disintegration doesn't continue to recur. Uh, within that, trying to impact U.S. policy towards the Middle East in directions that favor de-escalation, ending civil wars, uh, relieving human suffering, and working towards a regional order that is stable rather than fueling regional division and regional conflict, uh, which is creating civil wars and carnage in the long term. Terrific, Paul. Thank you. Paolo, please. We are brought uh, into the daily data checking by the public debate and we are brought into being uh, mainly a migration institute since migration is the only topic strongly debate. If you ask, as you do, what is my priority out of this too heavy burden is uh, first to, to s uh, put a strong emphasis on the future, as everybody said, and there is one future I'm more concerned, we are more concerned of, is the future of Europe. Thomas, please. Three main directions. I mean, it's not to, to sum up all the, the production we have at E3, but to try to, to simplify. The very first one, it is we, we work very, very consistently on the relation between China and the US to try to anticipate the curse of the globalization. Second uh, big uh, direction, it is obviously the future of Europe, both domestically and externally. So we work a lot on uh, European security issues, the relation with, um, with, uh, with the Middle East, with, uh, with Russia, uh, namely. Um, also, we, 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 we do intend to develop you know, partnership and to work more on a sub-African um, region. So for instance, we started a new forum uh, quite recently with four European think tanks, Bruegel, 
ISP, Rosie and IFRI, and four African think tanks, ADP, PCNS, Bertrand Foundation, and uh, EPS from Ethiopia, because for, for us it's a real concern in terms of migration, in terms of security, in terms of climate change, and so on. And the final direction, it is something which may be more difficult to explain, but it is a tension between the perception of a limited world in terms of uh, natural resources and an unlimited world in terms of uh, technological access. And we do believe that there is a strong tension, you know, in terms of artificial intelligence, for instance, and we research on that as well. Well, I think we see a strong intersection uh, between the many think tanks here, but I'm sure the many think tanks uh, that exist uh, on the principal issues that are driving our intellectual curiosity and the imperative for the work that we have to do today, not just to help us understand what's be right before us, but to skate to where the puck will be. Um, we've got about a half hour left, ladies and gentlemen. So what I'd like to do is uh, go out to the audience. I see hands already. Let me just offer a couple of ground rules, please. Uh, First, we're going out on webcast, so I would ask, we have microphones, I think, that are, will come to you. Thank you, there's one. So take the microphone. I, I would ask you to identify yourself, please, so we know uh, where you're from. And uh, I know we have a lot of scholars and leaders, uh, as well as folks who uh, are trying to stay warm. Uh, so, uh, but everyone is welcome to ask a question. I just ask that about 30 seconds into this, I can perceive a question mark in your process. So let's go out to questions and we'll go for about a half hour. Yes, sir, in the back, uh, right on the, yes, sir, on the uh, aisle. Thank you very much for this important forum. I'm Bill Clifford, president of the World Affairs Councils of America. Marvelous. Um, the hockey puck analogy didn't exactly go where I thought it might. I very much understand your primary audience is elite policymakers, and you're concentrating on the issues. That's a must for sure. But you know, given the disconnect between elites and non-elites, given the disconnect between the coasts and the heartland, I'd love to know your strategy and deployment of resources on how to engage uh, nonpartisan civil society organizations, such as the World Affairs Councils and others, to to have more of a dialogue than the dissemination of research and the outward communication without a return. And I'd love to hear also from the, the um, overseas-based think tanks on how they're doing the same in, in Europe. Thank you. Uh, terrific question. We'll go a question after another, and then as we get to the end, we'll do a lightning round. But Sarah, you started all this with the, uh, the hockey analogy, uh, and I know you've got a great answer, so please. Well, let me give you two examples, because there are 100 that you're, you've diagnosed the problem for relevance uh, perfectly. So two examples. The first is that um, and we were predominantly researchers, but the source of insight is not just numbers that our scholars come into a community or into a field of uh, data and mine, but actually understanding that insight comes from places. So we're frequently doing what we call community participatory research now where the design of the research project itself is often uh, designed with the community. Let's say we're working in uh, uh, public housing or economic development workforce in a community. You actually gather people. Sometimes we use residents of a community to collect information, and we very much use uh, partners in the community to interpret information so that the Insight, the whole process involves a different set of actors. Uh, you know, know about us without us is increasingly something we hear, particularly in criminal justice, but in a whole range of issues. Um, another thing is that often our work, we, we use our analysis to set the table in a decision-making process, and so the key question is who's around the table? And if, again, if we're working in a particular city, uh, you know, there are plenty of processes that involve civic leaders and electeds and whatnot. And in, we're always insisting that the, the tables that are being set, often around some piece of analysis that we use, uh, is a much broader array of voices. And we will um, uh, uh, often now at our think tank, we not only have the scholars who can do the table setting analysis, but we have people who are skilled at managing those much more collaborative processes. So we have a different mix of skill sets in our institution to be able to engage more effectively. It's one of the many places where diversity and insight from the communities that we're doing our work in really matter. 
Thank you, Sarah. That was terrific. Let's let's also go to uh, Paolo and uh, Thomas for the international perspective, and then we'll go to the next question. I'll give you one example uh, on migration. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there is a need, as, as you said, and uh, as I said, not to channel uh, information, but to have a dialogue. And uh, there are a number of vectors we, we, we meet regularly on migration. They, but they meet on emergency. These are uh, uh, church organization, NGOs, uh, security f um, apparatus, city officer, and we invited them in a permanent table, which meets uh, every two months, uh, out of the emergence, which means they do not meet to, to understand what to do when a boat arrives in the harbor, but to find a way to discuss uh, solutions and uh, tools and policies out of this emergency. We did so far two meetings. Uh, it's too soon to say if this is successful, but they are coming and we are meeting. And it's the first time we put together different stakeholders for the diff same issue. I, I would take another example. Um, you, you are very often asked, you know, as a European think tank to, to publish uh, in English your production. To, to, be, to be read, which we, we do, obviously. But we decided also to continue to publish in French, also in Russian, that's another, that's another story. But I insist on that for the French because we have now the feedbacks. Uh, the country uh, in which we are the, more, the most read, the more read, sorry, uh, that's the African countries. So to some extent, that's absolutely fascinating to observe all our production is read thanks to the French language, you know, uh, in African countries. So we address people we simply uh, didn't address before by continuing to publish, you know, um, uh, uh, in, in French. So for us, it's something we will, uh, we will continue. So to address the uh, other uh, audiences, many things on migration, we have similar things that I uh, think mentioned by um, by Paolo, you know, uh, working group with Meyer, people really uh, concerned by the, the migrants issue, even if it's not at the same scale in France than in, than in Italy. And we try also to develop specific products for young people. Uh, so that's, I think, for all of us, you know, infographics, things, uh, things like that. Uh, Paul or Ken, anything you'd like to add? Comment. Please. To comment about a link with civil society that was raised by a bill, but I think, I mean, in the Middle East context, that civil society, I mean, think tank work in the 90s and the 2000s really ended up uh, empowering and impacting civil society, a disempowered public, and was a great part of the dynamic that then led to the, to the Arab Spring. That indicated, one, the power of ideas, and I was rather shocked to see you know, in a, in a, in a f fallow ground in the 90s and 2000s, an idea thrown out by a think tank that's been thought through, whether it's about a political issue or an economic issue or a social issue, in such a dry context, it was taken up so quickly by a thirsty public. Uh, and a lot of these think tanks structurally became part of the civil society network, the young people's network that ended up spearheading the initial movements. Uh, it's also the reason why governments in the Middle East, and I would dare say in Russia and other places, afraid of color revolutions, have, have hit down hard on think tanks mm -hmm. because think, thinking matters and ideas are very powerful, and they're being stamped out. Yeah, and uh, look, we uh, have we we have various fora around the country that we regularly take part in and have speaking series in four different cities now and they get a diverse array of people taking part but we also encourage our uh, experts to go around the world and those who you know a colleague in Germany doing a number of uh, events right now we've had others who've gone into the uh, and in, in German do events in French do events in Arabic uh, to engage with uh, people in civil society and also journalists and others uh, not just in capitals but also uh, off the beaten track to uh, both uh, give a better sense of the direction of things here in Washington but also to improve our feedback on uh, what's going on around the world it's become a big part of, of what we do well, thanks for those answers. And I think one of the uh, uh, 
uh, we've touched on it, but it has not been, it, and, and if I offered it as a, a question to be tabled, we'd probably have a lot to say, but the issue of Africa. Uh, Africa, by the middle of this century, will provide some of the greatest opportunities we have seen in several centuries, but can also provide some of the greatest challenges. And for think tanks who are considering and bearing down on the issue of what Africa and Africans face in the next century is going to be extraordinarily important. And I see that, I know that our European colleagues are, are deeply engaged on that, and I really applaud that. Let's go to the next question, please. Yes, ma'am, in a second. Uh Good morning, Angelique Hedberg with RTI International. Thank you for being here and your comments. I am curious how you're thinking about managing your talent in the future and your organizations as the leaders of those organizations. You mentioned technology and you mentioned communications. There's an evolving role for your researchers in the future and how your organization recognizes the talent to remain a competitive think tank and how, what strategies you're deploying to, to evolve that role of the researcher within the institute. Who'd like to start with that? I will. Um, we're uh, obviously thinking about the challenges of the future. Sarah touched on it a bit in terms of uh, the grand uh, forces that are at work. We call them megatrends as well. Uh, so we have to anticipate what those are. Uh, a couple of things shape our thinking in that regard. We, we are looking for, uh, we're looking obviously for diversity, number one. That gives us the pool to be able to see more deeply into the future and more with greater breadth into the challenges we face every day. Uh, we're looking for scholars, sometimes we use the term, who are bilingual in the context of they not only understand the policy process, uh, but they also understand how technology and the future will shape some of those policy processes in ways we can't now imagine. And, and here I go again, uh, we're also looking for youth. Uh, the, the intersection of technology and young scholars from a diverse field is an extraordinarily powerful pool of talent, and we think in those terms. Anyone else care to comment? Yes, sir. Thomas, please. And I'll come back to you, sir. Well, at IFRI, we do consider that it's at least uh, five years to educate a researcher, so it's a huge investment. As soon as you, you do a mistake, that's, that's, uh, that's something difficult to, to repair. So we are very, very concerned by the, um, I would say, the employment process. Uh, we, we try in the recent decade to uh, found some PhD, so people having the ability to make their, their PhD and to start as a think tanker. And uh, we are searching, I would say, uh, in good English, le mouton à cinq pattes. I don't know what to say in, uh, in English, but you know, the guy or the woman who is able to interact with the political sphere, with the business sphere, uh, having a very strong academic background and able also to have a media um, exposure. So it depends on each individual. Some of them are more or less good in, uh, uh, in uh, these uh, four spheres. Some of them are better in one but you should be able to uh, address these four, these four spheres for, for, for sure. That's something we, we ask very, very seriously to our researchers. Can I? Please, Paolo. I, I play the, again, the minority. Can I, would you allow me for the last time? Uh, this is a huge challenge because we, have, we ask for people with a PhD background, they have to be able to write a PhD thesis but also to tweet, to write a short note, to give interview, to talk to minister, to talk to the, to listen to the taxi driver, uh, possibly to dance samba. <laughs> and play hockey. <laughs> and we pay them 1,500 euro per month. That's the issue. That's an incredible issue. But we have a, a, a nice story. This is the most beautiful job in the world. But sometimes it doesn't, it's not enough. Uh, but it's, it's a huge challenge. Sarah, please. So in service of how you reach some of the goals that each of you, uh, we're trying to do some things differently in how we both recruit and retain talent. 
Um, first of all, I'm trying to ban the use of the word fit, cultural fit, with our institution, because if you, you replicate yourself, if you allow people to look for someone who looks just like you or has the same credential, you end up will only hire people from the Michigan M math, you know, economics department or whatever. We're also looking for um, uh, alternatives to the PhD, for example, as the criteria. What is the skills that you learn in pursuing a PhD, and what other ways might someone acquire those skills and competencies that might be different, that allow you to look at a much broader pool uh, of individuals? And then when people are on board, it's really important to be clear what success looks like to people. In many ways, we found that we communicated informally what success was, and then people who proceeded uh, to be successful, uh, kind of had that ability to informally communicate. And they ended up being the people who looked a lot like and had the same background with the current incumbent leaders uh, at the top who were not particularly diverse and had a same particularly discipline and training in their schools. So if you instead say, we're going to be very explicit and be much more articulate about what success looks like in outcomes, not necessarily in credentials, then you start finding a broader set of people have a chance to be successful in your organization. Um, that process is painful because when you go to articulate it, it challenges a lot of assumptions that particularly your leadership has about what, you know, who's earned the chance to have the same stature that I might have, the same title that I might have in the organization. So it's a, it's, there's a lot of time and energy uh, going into that, but I think it's profoundly important if we're going to have the kind of people be successful in the future. Uh, one, let me just make a quick comment. Did anyone else want to comment on this? One of the things we talk about uh, here as well is the, the absence of, of clear career progression for public policy specialists. And so we think a lot at Brookings about how do our young scholars both have the capacity to progress in a career, pro, a career process, but also professional development. So it's two things, career progression and professional development for public policy uh, specialists and authorities and at the same time uh, auguring their capabilities academically as well. Uh, and that's a, a real challenge, I think, for most think tanks. Please, Ken. Yeah, let me, let me know one point. In terms of managing talent, which we haven't uh, discussed, I think it's, it's uh, managing intellectuals uh, can be, a, uh, can be uh, a challenge, some have noted over the years. Uh, um, but, but no, but in, in all truth, it's, it, the, impact, the focus on morale, we've tried to be very unhierarchical at Hudson. We really have tried to keep the hierarchy as flat as possible, and we've done so out of a belief that intellectuals have to uh, uh, feel that they have the freedom to say and, and do what they want to do uh, as long as it is fits within the framework of respectful research-based uh, policy work, uh, but that uh, uh, and we need to keep morale high because it's a competitive market. We have lost people to other think tanks. We have poached people from other think tanks. And uh, it, I, we, this is uh, something that uh, and experts won't be productive if they feel that they are constantly being uh, uh, pressured by management. Uh, uh, so it's important that we have the, the hire the right people and uh, we try to leave them be to the extent uh, it's possible as long as they're productive and entrepreneurial, which is very important. Uh, Jim, I think you had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, two Can we get let's get the microphone to you? There we are, please. Uh, two questions. Yeah, and, and this is Jim again, by the way, for those of you who missed it. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, there hasn't been a discussion in terms of that the traditional model for think tanks is the academic model. And my contention is that's shattered both in terms of communications, data scientists, fundraising and in terms of the executives and the tensions that creates in terms of that shift. So I'd be curious, a response to that. And I'm also curious that there hasn't been mentioned to the intelligence group's presentation earlier in the week and Dan Coates' comments who said um, we need to um, seek and speak truth, which is something you would often hear from think tanks. And it, the moment itself and the challenge it poses in terms of presenting facts against, in terms of the administration, I think is interesting. And that it's not just think tanks and others that are a part of this debate and, uh, and challenge. Um, so I'm curious in terms of the response to those two things. I'll make a couple of comments. Uh, I think I 
I let them all speak for themselves. Uh, but we pride ourselves on being nonpolitical, nonpartisan. Uh, and we, we may not get political on an issue, but that doesn't mean we won't address a policy. Uh, and policies exist often as a result of a political process, but the policy is, of course, where we should spend our time. Um, and we may not be political, but we're also not values neutral. And we'll take a values-based issue or a position on many things, and I think that's, that's important as well. I think your, uh, your comment about what is, what is the reality of the 21st century in many respects for the relevance of a think tank, you're exactly correct. And it's been addressed here. Uh, you know, often think tanks 50 years ago, uh, you had to have a terminal degree and you had to be able to publish a monograph. And that was, that was it. That was, that was pretty much where this ended. But think tanks now must be, as I said, flexible and agile. And so I think we need to think differently about the kinds of educational qualifications that the scholars have to have in the 21st century. It's not to say that we diminish at all the importance of a PhD. But we have to think differently about that. We have to think differently about how I think technology shoots through everything. Uh, and if we're imaginative about that, then we can see to the deep horizon much more clearly. And technology both gives us the capacity for, for a, uh, a, a more relevant set of facts because they're they're based on technology, and we can see where technology is leading society in the context of megatrends. And so we just have to think differently. And I'll open the floor to anyone else who wants to. Paul? Uh, yeah, maybe to again to disaggregate, I mean, it also, I think, depends on what, what policy area that think tank is looking at in which program. There are some areas which require really serious academic, quote unquote, scientific credentials, and where that scientific report will really have a big impact because that's the nature of that issue. Climate change might be one, we don't do any work on it, some things like that. Uh, in other areas, which might be more transactional or more diplomatic and so on, we have found that getting somebody who is a you know, former diplomat or somebody who has experience in that area where the challenge is not so much the science and the report, but how to go from peace, from war to peace, or how to, so you'd find somebody different to engage in that area. A third criteria, which is impact, makes you look at uh, two additional criteria to put in your think tank. One is the ability of that person to communicate, uh, you know, great Twitter followings, great on TV, good to, uh, to brief people, and that, that might take you away from an academic who is effectively trained to be a hermit. You know, you, you become an academic by becoming a hermit and not communicating and being in the carols of some library somewhere, which disqualifies you in a way from a, from a think tank role. And the other criterion as well, which all of us do, we want people who have impact possibly in policy circles. So you get, sometimes you want people in your think tank who just have, have come from government or have contacts in your region and that's why they're there, and 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 that. So, so it's a bunch of people that you need to uh, you need to get. And I'm struck by, yeah. If you look back at when think tanks first began, it was you just put out the monograph and you know sit on it. And maybe the term think tank was correct. The lumbering, heavy. I think we're more like having to be nimble. Maybe we're more like think drones at this point. <laughs> you have to be swarming all over the place and being at the right place at the right time. Please, Sarah. So one thing that I'm sort of shocked, but we haven't mentioned because you talk about the business model, is where the money comes from. Um, and all of us have slightly different funding mixes, I suspect. Um, uh, Urban is very different than Brookings in that we are sort of, uh, in some ways, like half like Rand and half like uh, uh, some of these others that get independent funding from uh, uh, foundations and individuals and corporations. Um, but that, for each of us, the mix of funding and how you retain your independence with that mix of funding is a perennial set of challenges, if, particularly if you're getting some funding from government or uh, from companies. Um, and then the other, the other question is where are the competitors come from? And the, we've, we've hinted at this idea that there are a lot more voices in the, uh, the debate. Let me mention two others. Universities, which used to be the scholar who wrote the monograph too and hoped somebody would find it on the internet, 
uh, today are building what are essentially mini think tanks with very different, you know, focused on a line of work, not always cross-cutting, but those think tanks have the ability that their faculty are paid for through different sources, so a lot of their expertise doesn't have to get paid for in the same way we do. Um, and they can have an endless stream of graduate students and undergraduates who can support some of the work, which means, um, and they have alumni who are a source of funding. So the, the, the revenue model makes them very different. They're further away from the debate in some ways, a little uh, further away from Rain Gretzky perhaps, but um, in many ways they have world-class brilliant experts who we struggle to uh, be able to be relevant in the same debate with them. So that's one source. The other is that some of the firms themselves with their own data assets are building their own, some cases more instrumental, in some cases quite independent institutions as well. So we have a lot more voices in the policy debate than we did in the past. Okay, we have about five minutes left. Let me, this is a speed round. Uh, so your question's gotta be out in about 15 seconds and we'll, I get, we'll do three. So this gentleman in the second row. Sure. Um, Paul McAllister, Global Leaders in Unity and Involvement. Um, I'm also a minister. And one of the questions I have as I listen to one of the uh, panelists speak is, what role does the faith community have today uh, in, in light of the crisis that we face? And what would you expect for uh, faith community leaders to, uh, to take from think tanks such as yours to solve problems? Okay. And the lady on the aisle about halfway back, I saw her hand up. Right there, please. Hi there, my name is Pat McLagan. Um, the ultimate think tanks are the people who actually use your information. And they are the people who have the narratives that are the reality distortion field that ultimately determine you know, what's going to happen. I'm wondering what responsibility think tank leaders and think tanks themselves have in helping to change the capabilities of the people who are ultimately using the information. They're really the last link in the supply chain. Okay, and a final question. Sir, about five rows back on the uh, left. Hi, uh, I'm Matthias Jochum. I work at the Embassy of Austria. My question concerns, um, my questions are, is about your views of the changing role of increasingly well-funded private philanthropic foundations, such as um, prominent example, the, um, the Gates Foundation or the Open Society Foundations, which also increasingly engage in very long-term thinking uh, engaged, um, fo focused on large-scale problems, but who then use their own means perhaps to affect change in those areas. To what degree do you think that your role is sort of complementary or perhaps in a, in, a, in a more sort of competing space? Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, just about three minutes left, so anyone would care to answer any of those or all of those? Paolo. One word on, on your first question, very short. Uh, it depends on the topics. You, you were asking what what is the involvement of the faith community. It depends on the topics. We started in 2001 uh, a program on religion and international politics with relation to the Middle East mainly. And on migration, as mentioned, we have actively involved uh, the church and the different institution. In other topics, no. Sarah, please. Uh, increasingly, whether it's a Gates microphone, Foundation. microphone, please. I'm Increasingly, whether it's the Gates Foundation or the Ford Foundation or the Balmers or any of the new voices in philanthropy, they are not saying, who's doing good work? Let me hand out some money to support them. They are thinking about what change they want to drive in the world. And then they're looking at the ecosystem of thought leaders who can both help make them smart and who can help execute on a strategy that funders have. And so it changes the relationship of institutions like ours to become more of the co-creator and the thought partner with institutions like that. Uh, some people worry, and there's a, a book, Winner Take All, that many people are talking about, that, that, the, that those kinds of institutions and the, the solution set that they're willing to tackle may be too limited, but it's not the only force of change, and it is an important additional source of change to the public sector, particularly in Washington when it's so paralyzed. So I would argue that those are, um, you have to understand the way they engage, but they're, that's generally a very uh, positive dynamic in the world. Ken, did you have something? Yeah, on faith leaders, we have a regular stream of faith leaders coming to Hudson. We were 
involved in coming up with the idea for the faith-based initiative under the Bush administration, and even uh, constant, we just had a major summit on persecution of Christians in the Middle East, that there were more men in different kinds of robes, men and women in different kinds of robes than I could possibly identify. On the issue of uh, the, the, the consumers of our uh, policy work, look, there's a learning curve here in Washington. It happens to everyone. Uh, who comes here, uh, even in clearly even in the think tank world as well, and bringing people up to speed, giving them new perspectives, deepening their appreciation of of aspects of policy they might not have uh, understood. That's a key part of what all of us do on a daily basis, and uh, is critical to, uh, to to our work. Well, Thomas, Paolo, Paul, Sarah, Ken. Uh, this is a tremendous panel. I can't thank you enough for your insights. And ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our panelists today. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.